I'm Christy Schreiber, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Schreiber, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. For the next two episodes, we will be discussing American naturalist writer and celebrity Jack London and reading his most anthologized short story, To Build a Fire. In our Into the Wild discussions, we mentioned that Chris McCandless, uh, the young man who walked into the Alaskan wilderness never to return, greatly admired Jack London and, in fact, is thought to have taken London's book, The Call of the Wild, with him on the Stampede Trail. Uh, And as we get into London's life, um, it is no mystery why. I mean, London was an adventurer. He lived homeless for a while, even serving time in prison for vagrancy. He explored the entire world in grand fashion, you know, not just the great Northwest, but including the Northwest. And uh, London, since a teenager, he took great personal risks, and yet... Not only did he live to tell about them, his adventure stories turned him into the highest paid writer of his day and likely the most famous. And yet, although London lived longer than Chris McCandless and uh, did not die on one of his many adventures, his life was also tragically cut short accidentally. Yes. And another thing, uh, you know, that if we're just going to talk about Jack London and Chris McCandless, they had another thing in, in common. Both of these men have stirred up some controversy over the years. You know, the difference is that Chris McCandless didn't mean to, and I think would probably be totally surprised if if he knew his life had become so controversial. Whereas Jack London, oh no, he did it on purpose, especially once he got famous. (laughs) You know, there is still a wide uh, range of opinions in regard to Jack London. I mean, there's a disagreement as to who he was, whether he was or wasn't a good writer, whether he was or wasn't a good human being, you know, whether his works, um, although incredibly successful during his day, are worth reading anymore. And uh, the reasons for this are, are all over the place. Some say London's work are, are not of literary merit, and others say that they are insightful. Um, he's accused of being racist. Others say he and his works are open-minded and modern and sophisticated. Uh, about the only thing that is not controversial about Jack London is that he was a man who knew how to make himself into a legend. I mean, his legendary celebrity status uh, is the one thing that was never in question. He was, by the time of his death, the most famous and most well-paid writer in the entire world. Well, that's something to say for a man who grew up like he did. I mean, I would completely agree with you. Uh, Jack London, uh, what would that guy have done in an age of TikTok and iPhone? I mean, we can only imagine. He famously wrote at least a thousand words a day. And as such, his body of work is incredibly large. I mean, he's got 400 pieces of nonfiction, 200 short stories, more than 50 books. His most famous today we know to be called The Wild, White Fang, and The Sea Wolf. But besides that, he did other things. He wasn't just a writer. He took over 12,000 photographs documenting a lot of it was documenting the living conditions of the poor in London. But he also documented, you know, freezing refugees of the Russo-Japanese War, other political events and, and events that were just of human interest of his day. He also was an accomplished sailor. He built his own 45 foot yacht and then sailed it around the world. He sensationalized his own life and all the way used every experience as an opportunity for a story. And every story that he wrote sold by the thousands. So let's begin by telling his rags to riches story. Ironically, though, it's the one story he never wrote. And then we'll situate his work within the context of naturalism, the period in which he wrote, uh, by looking at the famous short story, To Build a Fire. The story, you know, really doesn't strike the reader as necessarily a deep story at first pass, but once we understand a little bit of the background, it makes more sense as to why a story about almost nothing, an unnamed man walking across the Klondike in sub-zero weather, is something that we still find important to read a hundred years later. But Gary, let's get started by bringing us up to speed about the world that London lived in, the, the world that he was born into, the events and the ideas that led him to such an extreme setting. Oh, for sure. There were many, many cultural forces going on at that time. And so for context, 
Uh, London was born in San Francisco in 1876. Of course, uh, we think of that time period as the post-Civil War era, which it was, but London uh, is not in the American South. He's in the American West, and the ideas that rocked his worldview were not coming out of the southern part of America. Uh, London grew up in the urban area of Northern California, where, like all urban areas, working conditions for the poor were unthinkable. Um, He read a lot. But he wasn't reading Mark Twain or Nathaniel Hawthorne, but thinkers from Europe. Uh, There were new ideas, and uh, these were challenging the traditional societal norms and values. Uh, Charles Darwin and Herbert Spencer and Friedrich Nietzsche and Karl Marx. I mean, what what a pantheon of writers. I mean, of course, these are just a few of the big names, but this gives you an idea of how things were changing. Um, of Charles Darwin's book, Origin of the Species, it challenged the Christian narrative that God created the world and that man has a divine purpose of being in it. Uh, Karl Marx's book, The Communist Manifesto, challenged the social order and the capitalism that had created the titans of the day, like Carnegie and Vanderbilt and Rockefeller. And, uh, we know Nietzsche as the man who famously said, God is dead and we have killed him, uh, as well as creating the term Superman to mean the highest principle of human development. And of course, um, Herbert Spencer's uh, social Darwinism and the development of the idea of the survival of the fittest. What uh, these men did, especially when you put them together, uh, you know, and this is an oversimplification for the purpose of summarizing a large and a complex movement, but what they did was to create a new worldview that was completely different from the Christian worldview that had been prevalent up to that time. You know, and and the reason this is important, that a lot of these ideas that you just talked about from those men, we're going to find them reflected in London's work. I mean, he is not writing from a Christian worldview. He's not writing from a romantic point of view, and he's not writing from a transcendental point of view. He's writing from a naturalist point of view. This doesn't mean nature. This is very different. It's a very different way of looking at the world. You know, well, it is. And instead of believing that a a sovereign and all-powerful God made man in his own image with a design and purpose, the prevailing thought in academia was now that circumstance had created man as a speck, and man and the world he inhabits really has no design. Um, There is no purpose to it. Evolution has no end goal. You know, history isn't going any specific place. There's no right or wrong. There is only cause and effect. And the entire cosmos, including people, are governed by its prescribed uh, nature. And, you know, there are laws in this universe, and there is a nature of things as they exist, and the nature of things is what determines how life goes. And ultimately, the world, you know, including everyone's individual future, is just a matter of math. And if you drop a glass, it will break. If you drive too fast, you will wreck. If you smoke, you will likely get cancer. If you are born poor, you will likely die poor. If you are mean, you will likely have no friends. I mean, well, we're really extrapolating on <laughs> Darwin or taking us to a new uh, direction. But everything has a cause and a correlating effect. And nothing or no one is intervening from outside this closed cosmos. And no one is miraculously coming to save you from yourself or from your circumstances. But at the same time, if you observe the world, there's a chance you could predict some of the outcomes. You know, and what that means when it comes to people in everyday lives, you know, they those sound like dark ideas, and they are, and they're matters of philosophy. Well, they're not totally dark, but they're matters of for religious thinkers. Uh, so, you know, the big questions that these writers and these artists were exploring in some sense, and this is what we're going to see uh uh, in, and to build a fire is what does this mean? You know all those revelations that you talked about, and and this story is about a guy who makes a pretty boneheaded decision, and he's going to pay a price for it. London tells the story as dispassionately, as scientifically as as one possibly could. He doesn't blame the man for his mistakes, and quite possibly suggests perhaps he had no choice in the matter. His mistakes were the sort of things that were consistent with his nature. Uh, What is a person to do? What can you do except act according to your nature? I mean, after all, isn't that what all organisms do? Everyone, every organism, plant, animal, even organic material behaves according to its nature. We are confined to our natures. And sometimes that works to our advantage 
And other times it doesn't. (laughs) So can naturalism be kind of a pessimistic worldview? (laughs) Well, I mean, I'm not going to talk about the movement in general, but the writers, sometimes they have been accused of being such. I mean, these are the guys that we're talking about. Um, John Steinbeck and and his works, you know, Of Mice and Men and Grapes of Wrath or Stephen Crane, The Red Badge of Courage. I mean, if you've read those books, you know, these are not you know, happily ever after kind of stories. I mean, it's expressed in these these natural environments. A lot of them, by the way, are in urban environments, although, uh, you know, Jack London is the exception. But, but what we can see is that things can be brutal and the choices people make or don't make can, can have consequences. But we'll see, even in London's story, uh, that things are not all dark. There is valor and honor and, and, almost a slice of redemption. So there's no doubt that these guys were honestly questioning accepted ideas about the nature of the universe and why things are the way they are. Uh, and it, it should come as no surprise when we tell you a little bit about London's past, uh, that these are things that would resonate with Jack London. I mean, you can see why this particular guy might question how the universe it, it was working because for a long time it really was not working well for him. London's family was not ideal. It was certainly not traditional by any definition, but sp- certainly not according to the standards of his day. I mean, his mother, Flora, she was a music teacher. She was a professed spiritualist. She was an astrologist, and that would have been different from the other moms. Uh, but she also struggled with mental illness. And his real dad, Professor W.H. Cheney, by many accounts, wanted Jack to be aborted. And in fact, uh, refused to accept any or even acknowledge paternity of Jack. Flora refused to abort the child and instead shot herself, uh, either attempting to kill herself or pretending to kill herself. I say by many accounts uh, because there's a, several different versions of the story and you know who really knows what actually happened. In some of the versions, these two are actually married. Other accounts say no. Some say she pretended to kill herself. Others say no, no, no. She really did try to kill herself. You know, it's just a mess. It is a mess. (laughs) And the end result, though, was chaos for Jack. I mean, the couple split. Eight months later, Jack was born. Uh, Flora married John London. Uh, She named her son John Griffith London, after the new stepdad, uh, the new family moved to Oakland, California. That's a little bit outside of San Francisco. and But they were poor. I mean, they really lived hand to mouth. Um, John London, the father, he was a disabled war veteran who really couldn't keep a job. I mean, he brought respectability to the family for sure, but he had no means to make any. So uh, Flora did a lot, but she also hired a wet nurse Uh, to nurse little Jack because she just didn't feel like she could emotionally raise him. This decision, though, resulted in one of the most positive and long-lasting relationships of London's life. Jack's nurse was Jenny Prentice, and uh, she ended up being really the most stable person uh, in his life. Jenny Prentice uh, had recently lost her own child. She was an African-American woman, and and Jack lived with her full-time for the first three years of his life. Then he lived off and on with her, Um, all through his teenage years. I mean, she was a loving presence for him and their relationship was reciprocal. She took care of him and he took care of her uh, her entire life or his entire life, really. Prentice was the one who nicknamed Little John Jack uh, because he jumped around like a jumping jack. Um, Becky, Jack's daughter, later in life had this to say about uh, the woman who raised her dad. Daddy always said that the only love and affection he knew as a child came from Aunt Jenny. He never remembered his mother kissing him. Well, I don't either. Grandma was not demonstrative. Aunt Jenny not only loved Daddy, she helped him in many ways, loaned him money, backed him in everything he did. She was a wonderful woman and a friend to everyone, not only to Grandma, but to Daddy and me, a loving friend. What a tribute, right? Uh, But when Jack was 13... Uh, He left home and and apparently, with the financial help of Aunt Jenny, bought a boat. He taught himself to sail and then got a job working as an oyster pirate. 
Gary, that sounds adventurous, but I had never heard of an oyster pirate before Jack London. Before I go on, I just have to say that is one of the coolest things, titles that you could possess. <laughs> Put that on your income tax form. I'm not sure you can. Oyster pirate. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, Jack joined a gang of small boat owners who outwitted armed guards in order to raid oyster beds in the middle of the night to sell to markets and saloons in the San Francisco area. London would have made more money on a single raid than he could have made uh, working three months at any other job. So he would have been able to find that age and with his little limited education. So oyster pirating paid off. (laughs) Well, you never know. Hanging out with the Motley crew. I mean, those were not, you know, church going folks. uh, And they taught him more than just to steal. And he discovered alcohol and brawling and he would, struggled with alcohol his entire life. At 17, though, Jack sailed for seven months across the Pacific, and he went up the Bering Strait on a seal hunting trip. After that, he marched on Washington with Kelly's Industrial Army because he was going to help demand government aid for the unemployed. Uh, That didn't work out, and Jack eventually landed in prison for vagrancy. When he got out of there, he came back to California and decided to go to school. He enrolled in Oakland High School, uh, and that's when he started educating himself, really mostly at the public library. That's where he got into Darwin and Marx and Nietzsche. And after one year, he crammed all four years in, of high school into one year. He was able to graduate. By 19, he was an avid socialist, a graduate from high school. Uh, he passed the entrance exam. And now he was ready to start a new life at the University of California, which he did for one semester until he had to drop out because he needed to go back home to support his mom, his stepdad, and his siblings. So he did that until age 21. Then he was off again. But this time he was going north. Jack, with his 60-year-old brother-in-law, Cap Shepard, borrowed money and headed for the Klondike after the gold. And although he never found any gold and he stayed, you know, just under a year, it said that Jack London monetized the Klondike gold rush more than any other prospector in the country. In retrospect, this would be the most valuable period of his life. But Gary, the Klondike gold rush isn't something that I knew much about. Uh, When I think of the gold rush, I think of the one in California in 1849, hence the 49er football team. But apparently that is not the only gold rush. Tell us about this one. Well, I would like to make a correction to the actual real discovery of California gold was in 1848. So that team should be called the 48ers, but I won't dispute the history of that. I don't think it sounds as good. (laughs) It doesn't quite have the uh, the pros. The ring, yeah. no. Well, you know, the 1849 gold rush uh, started a series of gold rushes that culminated in what turned out to be the greatest one of all, the Klondike gold rush of 1898 and 1899. And it took place near Dawson City um, in the Yukon Territory, which is in Canada, about 100 miles from the border of Alaska and um, about 200 miles south of the Arctic Circle. In total, uh, 12 million ounces of gold have been extracted from the area over the years, and people still look for gold there today, although it's rare really to find any. It's estimated that in 1898, 100,000 people set out for the Klondike, and of those that went, 30,000 reached Dawson City, which was called the Paris of the North because it had an opera house, it had a newspaper, a church, a post office, a bank, and an entire street named Paradise Alley, you know, where miners could purchase female companionship. <laughs> well, it sounds a lot like the Wild West. It was the Wild West, <laughs> you know, and exactly. And if you look at pictures of it today, it looks like the Old West with saloons and everything. I mean, Dawson today has a Jack London Museum and healthy tourist amenities. Uh, but in 1898, it was the place where Stampeders discovered the bad news, which was all the prime sites for gold were already staked nearly a year before, and there was nothing to do but to work the claims of others for enough money to get back home. Um, in total, only about 30 miners became millionaires from the gold rush. 
out of the hundred thousand that thought they'd give it a go. I mean, that, you could that's have, your odds, right? Yeah, there. you could have gone in the lottery business. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, much has been said about London that you know he spent so little time there, and uh, but you know, after when you read about what it was like, he spent more time than I would have spent there. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure if I'd known what was up, I would have even gone. I mean, what London went through, it's its crazy. He took a boat, and he wasn't the only one. Everyone had to do this. He took a boat from San Francisco to the seaport at Sk- Skagway. Is that how you pronounce yes. it? Yes. Skagway? Mm-hmm. Well, so once you get to Skagway, you have to go through what they would call the White Pass. Pierce Barton, and he's a Klondike historian, he said that no horse made it across the pass. And it was nicknamed Dead Horse Trail. Hmm. And London talked about this uh, in the book, The God of His Fathers. And and this is what London had to say about the past. I want to read what London said. The horses died like mosquitoes in the first frost. And from Skagot to Lake Bennett, they rotted in heaps. They died at the rocks. They were poisoned at the summit. And they starved at the lakes. They fell off the trail where there was one. And they went through it. In the river, they drowned under their loads or were smashed to pieces against the boulders. They snapped their legs in the crevices and broke their backs, falling backwards with their packs. And the sloths, they sank from sight or smothered in the slime. And they were disemboweled in the bogs when the corduroy logs turned up in the mud. Men shot them, worked them to death. And when they were gone, went back to the beach and bought more. Some did not bother to shoot them, stripping their saddles off and the shoes and leaving them where they fell. Their hearts turned to stone, those who did not break, and they became beasts, these men on dead horse trail. <laughs> wow. I mean, is, this, is Jack talking about himself in this passage? Well, he's referring to his own experience there, but he didn't have horses. In London's case, he hauled everything on his back, and that's a lot. He hauled an entire ton, a literal ton of supplies going back and forth 40 times. And he wasn't special. Lots of people did this. Uh, In fact, it's what most people did because the Canadian government required that each individual bring enough food to last a year. And that was a thousand pounds. Hmm. Well, uh, if you got past the past, uh, you weren't there yet. After the mountains is a string of lakes Everyone had to make their own boat and float another 350 miles to the gold fields. And as you might imagine, most miners didn't know how to make a boat. And so a large number of these sank as they hit the rapids in the canyon. And of course, don't forget uh, that all of this is happening, even if you are in the summer, in cold weather. I mean, it started snowing in September and you literally had to race to make sure that you beat winter. And that's exactly Jack's experience. I mean, the good news for Jack, though... He's an oyster pilot, so he's a great (laughs) sailor. And his group not only ran the rapids themselves, but Jack went back and he helped a young couple who had gotten trapped. Uh, But all this takes time. And Jack and his group arrived at Dawson on October the 9th, and they beat the mid-October freeze, which is what you had to do. You know, Jack's popular, he's friendly, and in Dawson he made a lot of friends very quickly. Two of his friends, Lewis and Marshall Bond, let him camp next to their cabin. Um, They had a dog named Jack, and Jack, the dog, became the model for Buck in The Call of the Wild. So London stayed in Dawson. He stayed there for six weeks, and he hung out in the saloons, and he just listened to people's stories. And this would be the subject matter for many, many years to come. After that, he and a few buddies set out in snowshoes 80 miles up the frozen river in temperatures, and listen to this, 70 below to dig for gold. And they found almost nothing. In June of that next year, with scurvy, Jack was out. Back on his way. And you have to reverse all that, this long (laughs) journey back to San Francisco. The last thing he wrote in his journal before getting on the steamboat home was leave St. Michael's unregrettable moment. (laughs) (laughs) He had no idea that experience was going to change his life and then make him rich. No, I mean, but it was a turning point. When he got back, he started writing. Uh, The story to build a fire most certainly was based on a letter that he received from a Catholic priest named Father Judge 
who describes for him a time that he fell through the ice but managed to save a lot, stay alive by building a fire. Every one of Jack's friends from those days ended up in a story. Uh, the first story he published, he made $5, and that story was titled To the Man on the Trail. After that, he sold another one, An Odyssey of the North, and he made $120 off of that. Two years after leaving the Klondike, he was the best-paid short story writer in America. After he published The Call of the Wild, his life changed forever. It was an immediate bestseller all over the world. Sold thousands of copies and millions. London was a celebrity. At the height of his celebrity, he was making, listen to this, at that time, $10,000 a month. But... For London, that still wasn't enough. His lifestyle was so extravagant, he was never less than $25,000 in debt his whole life. Hmm. He traveled the world. He was a war car correspondent in South Africa and Korea and Japan. And he lived in Hawaii and he lived in Australia. He got married. He got divorced. Two days later, after his divorce, he got married again. He was loved by many, but... He got ripped off by almost every single person uh, that he knew in his life. Uh, he died. Uh, well, so, well, let me just say this. Somebody even set fire to his dream house on purpose. He lived a large life and he died a larger life. I mean, at 40, he died from an accidental drug overdose on pain medications. So the story we're going to read uh, to build a fire wasn't written in those early days uh, when he just got back from the Klondike, even though you might think so because it's about his experience there. Uh, but to build a fire has a couple of renditions, but the one we're going to read, he didn't write until 1908. He was 32 at the time and he wasn't living anywhere near the Canadian frontier. In fact, he wrote to build a fire after a disastrous sailing expedition from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor. So I guess the parallel is both in the story and both in his real life, he was fighting nature, maybe in a different way. I don't know if that's what made him, gave him the idea to write that experience at that time. I don't know, but it came to his mind. And so there we have it. We ready to open up and, and read this story to yes, build a fire? Yes, we are. All right, so let's get started. Day had broken cold and gray, exceedingly cold and gray, when the man turned aside from the main Yukon Trail and climbed through the high earth bank, where a dim and little traveled trail led eastward through the fat spruce timberland. It was a steep bank, and he paused for breath at the top, excusing the act to himself by looking at his watch. It was nine o'clock. There was no sun nor hint of sun, though there was not a cloud in the sky. It was a clear day, and yet there seemed an intangible pall over the face of things, a subtle gloom that made the day dark and that was due to the absence of sun. This fact did not worry the man. He was used to the lack of sun. It had been days since he had seen the sun, and he knew that a few more days must pass before that cheerful orb, due south, would just peep above the skyline and dip immediately from view. So... First idea we're going to walk away with in this story is that it's cold. <laughs> yeah, if you do a word count of the word, that word cold shows up 38 times in this story. The cold is always present. The word sun shows up five times in this first paragraph and then barely resurfaces again. I mean, there isn't a sun. It's not around. Let's keep going. The man flung a look back along the way he had come. The Yukon lay a mile wide and hidden under the three feet of ice. On top of this ice were as many feet of snow. It was all pure white, rolling in gentle undulations where the ice jams of the freeze-up had formed. North and south, as far as the eye could see, it was unbroken white, save for a dark hairline that curved and twisted from around the spruce-covered island to the south, and that curved and twisted away into the north, where it disappeared behind another spruce-covered island. This dark hairline was the trail, the main trail, 
that led south 500 miles to the Chilkoot Pass, Daya and Saltwater, and that led north 70 miles to Dawson, and still on to the north 1,000 miles to Nalato, and finally to St. Michael on the Bering Sea, 1,000 miles and half a thousand more. Well, and we just saw a bunch of the names that we've already talked about. I mean, the pass where all the horses die, the little town of Dawson, where all the miners go. But you can tell he is far out into the interior. It says there's a thousand miles and a half a thousand miles more. I mean, just the kind of language is using he's using is making us feel the expanse. It's very large. It's very empty. And all of it is cold. It's also white. There's three feet of ice just on the Yukon River. It reminds me, you know, one of those scenes from Star Wars. I mean, the reader could immediately see that people aren't supposed to be in this. <laughs> but all this, the mysterious far-reaching hairline trail, the absence of sun from the sky, the tremendous cold, and the strangeness and weirdness of it all, made no impression on the man. It was not because he was long used to it. He was a newcomer in the land, a Chichaquo, and that was his first winter. The trouble with him was that he was without imagination. He was quick and alert in the things of life, but only in the things and not in the significances. 50 degrees below zero meant 80-odd degrees of frost. Such fact impressed him as being cold and uncomfortable, and that was all. It did not lead him to meditate upon his frailty as a creature of temperature and upon man's frailty in general, able only to live within certain narrow limits of heat and cold, and from there on it did not lead him to the conjectural field of immortality and man's place in the universe. Fifty degrees below zero stood for a bite of frost that hurt, and that must be guarded against by the use of mittens, ear flaps, warm moccasins, and thick socks. Fifty degrees below zero was to him just precisely fifty degrees below zero. That there should be anything more to it than that was a thought that never entered his head. And so what do we see? It's a contrast. We see the nature of the land and we see the nature of the man. The land's cold. I mean, it's 50 degrees below zero. And, and But listen to how the man is described. Well, he's a newcomer. Um, you know, this is his first winter, so obviously he doesn't know how things work and how bad things can be. Exactly. He's new. Now, we all know what that means. I mean, when you're new, you do things that you later on are going to think are dumb. You don't know better. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're new at your job, your school, new at anything. I mean, that's what being new is. Uh, but it also says something else. It says that he's not able to imagine and that's a really interesting turn of phrase. You know, to imagine means to make a mental concept, to draw a conclusion, to make a judgment, to process things. It's what AI can't really do. I mean, it, it can observe, observe a lot of information. Uh, that's what this guy's doing. He's observing a lot of information. But what do you do with the data? You have to make meaning of it. And this guy, beyond just being a new person, isn't good at that. He doesn't know how to make meaning of things. And that's just his nature. As he turned to go on, he spat speculatively. There was a sharp, explosive crackle that startled him. He spat again and again in the air before it could fall to the snow, the spittle crackled. He knew that at 50 below, spittle crackled on the snow, but this spittle had crackled in the air. Undoubtedly, it was colder than 50 below, how much colder, he did not know. But the temperature did not matter. He was bound for the old claim on the left fork of Henderson Creek where the boys were already. They had come over across the divide from the Indian Creek country while he had come the roundabout way to take a look at the possibilities of getting out logs in the spring from the islands in the Yukon. He would be into camp by 6 o'clock, a bit after dark, it was true, but the boys would be there, a fire would be going, and a hot supper would be ready. As for lunch, he pressed his hand against the protruding bundle under his jacket. It was also under his shirt, wrapped up in a handkerchief and lying against the naked skin. It was the only way to keep the biscuits from freezing. He smiled agreeably to himself as he thought of those biscuits, each cut open and sopped in bacon grease, and each enclosing a generous slice of fried bacon. And so, there's our plot. 
We have a dude who's going to cross this snowy, cold trail to get to an old camp where the boys are. He knows the environment's rough, but since he knew, he doesn't really know how rough. I mean, he plans on being there by 6 o'clock for supper. He has his lunch. He has a plan to keep it warm. And it says a smile. You know, he reminds me of many young people. I mean, we've all been like this. You go out into the world with this sketchy plan and few supplies, probably not enough. I mean, I've been that person myself, although I haven't walked across the snow. I've done things late, uh, that I shouldn't later thought were not wise, maybe drove in the night with too little gas or too little sleep. I mean, I think everybody has done something like this at one point in their life. Um, I would say it's the nature of youth to do stuff like this. And uh, we all have stories if we live long enough of times when we tempted fate. Right. But this narrator seems to suggest that this particular man is particularly unthinking. And I hope I have never been as unthinking as this guy, but all he's doing is dreaming about the hot supper that he thinks he's going to get at six o'clock. He plunged in among the big spruce trees. The trail was faint. A foot of snow had fallen since the last sled had passed over, and he was glad he was without a sled traveling light. In fact, he carried nothing but the lunch wrapped in a handkerchief. He was surprised, however, at the cold. It certainly was cold. He concluded as he rubbed his numbed nose and cheekbones with his mittened hand. He was a warm whiskered man, but the hair on his face did not protect the high cheekbones and the eager nose that thrust itself aggressively into the frosty air. At the man's heels trotted a dog, a big native husky, the proper wolf dog, gray coated and without any visible or temperamental difference from its brother, the wild wolf. The animal was depressed by the tremendous cold. It knew that it was no time for traveling. Its instinct told it a truer tale than was told to the man by the man's judgment. In reality, it was not merely colder than 50 below zero. It was colder than 60 below, then 70 below. It was 75 below zero. Since the freezing point is 32 above zero, it meant that 107 degrees of frost obtained. The dog did not know anything about thermometers. Possibly in its brain there was no sharp consciousness of a condition of very cold, such as was in the man's brain, but the brute had its instinct. It experienced a vague but menacing apprehension that subdued it and made it slink along at the man's heels, and that made it question eagerly every unwanted movement of the man as if expecting him to go into camp or to seek shelter somewhere and build a fire. The dog had learned fire, and it wanted fire, or else to burrow under the snow and cuddle its warmth away from the air. So let's notice this. Uh, our narrator is omniscient. He sees everything. He's looking at the story with this outside perspective. He can see what the man is thinking, but he can also tell what the dog is thinking. And just like we were able to compare the nature of the man with the nature of the environment... Now we can compare the nature of the man with the nature of the dog. Now, the dog is not a newcomer. Uh, the man is surprised by exactly how cold this is turning out to be, but the dog, not so much. It says he's a lot like a wolf, and the dog is worried. The narrator tells us the dog's understanding is closer to truth than the man's understanding. The dog is closer to truth. I mean, it's 75 below, and the dog knows what that means. Uh, yeah, the narrator knows what that means. And, and just in case the reader doesn't understand what that means, in the next paragraph, he's going to give a few details that most anyone could understand about how cold it is. <laughs> Let me read that. The frozen moisture of its breathing had settled on its fur in a fine powder of frost, and especially where its joils, muzzles, and eyelashes whitened by the crystal breath. The man's red beard and mustache were likewise frosted, but more solidly, the deposit taking the form of ice and increasing with every warm, moist breath he exhaled. Also, the man was chewing tobacco, and the muzzle of ice held his lips so rigidly that he was unable to clear his chin when he expelled the juice. The result was that a crystal beard of the 
color and solidity of amber was increasing its length on his chin. If he fell down, it would shatter itself like glass into brittle fragments. But he did not mind the appendage. It was the penalty all tobacco chewers paid in that country, and he had been out before in two cold snaps. They had not been so cold as this, he knew, but by the spirit thermometer at 60 mile, he knew that they registered at 50 below and at 55. He held on through the level stretch of woods for several miles, crossed a wide flat of dark tusks and dropped down a bank to the frozen bed of a small stream. This was Henderson Creek and he knew he was 10 miles from the forks. He looked at his watch. It was 10 o'clock. He was making four miles an hour, and he calculated that he would arrive at the forks at half past 12. He decided to celebrate that event by eating his lunch there. (laughs) So basically, the hair on this man's face is frozen. Uh, The tobacco in the man's mouth is frozen to the point that he can't get the tobacco out of his mouth. And as a result, he has this yellow, grotesque icicle coming out of his mouth. That's got to be quite a sight. I know. I mean, this guy, he's clearly uncomfortable, but he's paying attention to the clock. He's making great time, four miles an hour. I mean, to me, that's almost running. He's making these 15-minute miles. I mean, he's got a plan. You know, and really, except for a slight hint from the narrator that this guy is not that smart and and it's really cold, there's not anything except a bad feeling to suggest that this guy isn't going to make it. Except if you know anything about naturalist stories, sometimes (laughs) they don't go well. Oh, are you spoiling things for us? Well, not entirely. You know, the next episode, we'll talk a little bit more about what it means to be a naturalist story and what naturalists think about the world and what London might be saying about the world. But I will tell you, There is not a general consensus about what London might be saying about the world. Are you surprised? No. (laughs) And that's why we like the story. He seems to be saying something about the world, man's place in the world, about being a novice, about how to navigate the world as a novice, how to confront, you know, some of life's most terrifying nemesis, maybe even death, you know, all the things that he did many times in his own life. But what his exact take on it? It's still a little ambiguous. And all that, next episode. (laughs) Well, until then, thanks for listening. And uh, don't forget that you can always find us at howtolovelitpodcast.com. On our website, we have listening guides for most of our episodes, as well as other teaching resources. And also, whether you're a teacher, a student, or a fellow lover of literature, please subscribe to our podcast via YouTube or Apple or Spotify, etc., Give us a rating, and if you like what you hear, possibly a review. It's when you share about the podcast to your friends on social media, via text or in class, that we grow. And thank you for supporting us in our mission to make reading great literature accessible and enjoyable to as many people as possible. Peace out.